Good snowy Sunday morning. So the first one of the year. And first and foremost, welcome back, Robertson. There, we're happy to have you back as always, and I'll bet you really love this kind of weather coming from where you're coming from. Okay, um, so let me start with some of the announcements. We have quite a few here, so bear with me. I hope I don't miss anybody, and if I do, please stop me. Um, I'm going to use the bulletin kind of as the as the uh, outline to work from. Uh, first of all, the Advent Bible study. You've seen it flashing around up here. That's still very much in play that uh, Marjorie's going to come back and be with us, I think, for three different sessions. That would be the 2nd, the 9th, and the 16th, 7.15 in the sanctuary. Um, Steve told me, don't ever forget, the November service challenge. That's outside the, uh, in the little uh, best fuel here uh, at the lakeside. Uh, please, for any of you who've done volunteer work, go over there, record it so we can keep an eye on that and track it. Um, one very near and dear to my heart, because I have a sabbatical coming up, I'll be in Honolulu through the winter, so I'm going to need some help up here. Um, and we lost, uh, I think we lost Sally. Sally moved on to another church. So we're down a couple, two or three uh, liturgists. So anyone who would like to try to challenge this one, you know, come up and do this stuff, help lead the worship, be very much appreciated if you'd raise your hand and join our team. Um, let's see here. What else do we have? Um, we have the Messiah coming up. I think that's all I need to do now is the, is the Messiah. And uh, Bruce, would you like to come up and, and uh, kind of brief everybody on where we are with that? So uh, last year we did celebrate Advent, but we did it remotely and we did it on video. And, uh, and as your worship and music team gathered and talked about what our vision for this season would be, it was very clear that we wanted to come back and do a live performance, that we wanted to do something that we've done in this church for generations, and that is bring back the Messiah performances. Uh, and so we've been working and rehearsing, and the orchestra is hired, and the soloists are procured, and uh, we will have refreshments. Um, the choir is baking cookies. Uh, and then this Friday, coming and Sunday will be the, the performances of Messiah. Um, for many people, this is the way that Advent gets launched. Uh, for many people that would not normally come to the inside the doors of a church, they will come to attend a concert. Um, they will come to attend this great classical work of art. Um, and so this is my plea. Um, will you consider inviting a neighbor? Uh, or two, um, your aunt and uncle, your first cousins that don't live too far away, um, and maybe take them out to dinner, uh, and then buy a couple extra tickets for Messiah and bring them. And I think it's a great way of encouraging them, entertaining them, and also bringing them into God's presence in a very real way. So help us this week as we prepare to um, worship together using Handel's Messiah. Thank you. Susie, I have not forgotten you. Susie has an announcement, too. She's going to talk about the ladies' tea, I think. Good morning. My name is Susie Graham, and I'm on the gathering team. And you may not know me because we haven't been doing a lot of gathering in the last couple of years. So we're back. We want to celebrate the end of 2021. And one of the things we haven't done in four years is a ladies' Christmas tea, which is all about us getting together, sharing all our stories, and looking towards the future. What really inspired me was getting ready for the 150th anniversary of our laying of the cornerstone. I was looking through the archives, and I found these tremendous silver um, teapot services and trays. So I thought about Carolyn Kim, and Carolyn was an amazing woman, as we know. 
But she must have had tea parties and at her house as well as in Heritage Hall. And all the things that they accomplished during those times, I think has been amazing. So let's continue that tradition. Uh, we will be having a Christmas tea on December 11th, thank you, Saturday. <laughs> um, so if you haven't signed up, please come see me. It's a table with the teapot. Um, you can be a guest. We're still looking for a couple hostesses. The second part of my presentation, though, is about the charity that we have chosen this year. And it is for the Haven um, of Pontiac for domestic violence women. And they have been through probably more than we can imagine. They shelter with their children. Um, and Christmas, we thought, should be special for the ladies. We would like to do a beauty bag specifically for them. The kids get toys and they get all kinds of practical things. We'd like to do something special for them. So we are creating a beauty bag, which you can see the contents outside as well, uh, for 40 women at Haven. Now, we need your help because we had to buy everything, uh, specific rules about how to donate this year. And um, if you can, an at-will donation to help support our gifts to these women would be much appreciated. And if you want to sign up, please, please come see me after service. Thank you so much. Thank you, Susie. I believe that concludes the announcements for now, except we have one more very important one. Mike has a moment to talk about stewardship. And by the way, if I missed anything, somebody raise their hand and let me know. So in the spirit of Thanksgiving, thank you for your blessings. The theme of this year's stewardship campaign, uh, for 150 years, God has blessed us together at Orchard Lake. Earlier this month, you heard from Gary Forehand and also from Mark Greco and myself about the current activities that were and programs here at Orchard Lake, both globally and in the community, in mission support, and in building usage and repairs, along with future goals for the church, including new leadership. I have always been an optimist. I see the glass half full, not empty. And in my favorite, one of my favorite quotes is from the book, The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. This is a day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. I think he was a U of M grad. I strongly believe together that we have weathered the storm here, that we are healing, that we are heading into the future with uplifting goals and aspirations. Collectively, we have expressed our wants, our, our needs, our goals. The future is bright with possibilities. Now is the time to act. Your giving is very important for reaching these goals, and I am very optimistic for the future. I hope and pray you to see the bright future this church has as we move forward with great plans and aspirations. Already, we have, already you have seen from a few weeks ago, uh, newly elected trustees, elders, and deacons. We have fresh leadership ready to go. And for those of you who have returned your faith promises, thank you very much. And if you have not had the opportunity to fill out your promise card, you can return them, you can drop them in the collection trays, you can mail them in, or you can go online and use our website. <clears throat> and for those of you who are still praying about your desire to support this church, please continue and consider your blessings in this place. For 150 years, God has blessed Orchard Lake through your love, your support, and your gifts. And ending this stewardship message, let me say, praise God from all things, all blessings flow. Praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thanks, Mike. Bruce? I am the editor. Oh, Prelude is next. I'm sorry.
Advent is a time of reflection and renewal. God of light, shine in our hearts and renew our hope. Advent is a time of self-examination. God of light, shine in our hearts and strengthen our resolve. Advent is a time of joyful expectation. God of light, shine in our hearts and renew our faith. Advent is a time of service and searching. God of light, shine in our hearts and ignite our compassion. Today we light the first candle, the candle of hope, reminding us that in sending Christ, God sent hope to the earth. Hope for a world free from war and pain, hope for a sense of purpose and belonging, and hope for peace and prosperity for our children and our children's children. When Christ came, he brought us the light of lights, light that fills us with hope, illuminates our lives, and shines in our hearts. Let's sing the response together. For those who are able, please stand for the call to worship. But as for me, I watch and hope for the Lord. Do not gloat over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will rise.
Please be seated. Please hear the call to confession. Creator God, you made the heavens and the earth. You set the planets in their courses, lit the sun with fire, caused the stars to shine and the world to turn. Life springs up where your breath moves. In Jesus Christ, you brought hope into a world full of fear and despair. You sent your spirit to enliven our hope and guide us on the way. We are waiting now in anxious times for the world to be made new. We wait for your light and we wait, we wait with deep hope. Amen. Let us pray our uh, common prayer of confession. Redeeming God, we confess that waiting in common to us. We want to be comfortable in this festive season, but the problems we see around us keep us anxious and unhappy. We complain and close our eyes to the suffering of others. Forgive us for ignoring realities we do not see. Forgive us for seeking our own comfort at the cost of others. Give us eyes to perceive the great needs within our community. Give us hands to build bridges of reconciliation and hope. Give us feet to walk with our neighbors. Turn our hearts to you again and again. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please take a few minutes for your own individual silent prayer of confession. Hear the good news. Jesus Christ entered the world to rescue sinners. He personally bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might be dead to sin, all that is good. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are all forgiven. Amen. This morning's scripture lessons from the Old Testament, Jeremiah 33, 14 through 16, the righteous branch and the covenant with David. Jeremiah was a prophet. He was gifted from God to have vision, both short and long-term vision. In this particular passage, we see more his long-term vision where he sees the righteous branch. He sees the Davidic line and he sees the coming of the Messiah. Please hear the word of God. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days, at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved, and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. From the Gospel of Matthew in the New Testament, we see Matthew 10, verses 16 through 22, coming persecutions. Jesus sees way down the road. He knows the disciples have followed him. 
He knows that they'll soon be his apostles and he'll have to send them out. So he has some very important inspirational words for them here in this passage when he says, have hope. He uses a very interesting metaphor here, the cunning of the fox and the, in the innocence of the dove. Please hear the word of the Lord. See, I am sending you out like sheep into the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of them, for they will hand you over to the councils and flog you in their synagogues. And you will be dragged before your governors and kings because of me as testimony to them and the Gentiles. When they hand you over, do not worry about how you are to speak or what you are to say. For what you are to say will be given to you at that time. For it is not who you speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Brother will betray brother to death and father his child and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all because of my name but the one who endures to the end will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Now let us pause here a bit. I think Carrie is going to uh, go over the mission matters for us. Please. Good morning, church. It's really good to see you and to be here. Uh, I thought I probably should start with an introduction. Uh, my name is Carrie Robertson. My husband is Andy Robertson. He is the son of uh, Reverend David Robertson, who, as many of you probably remember, um, was your, your pastor for a while. We have a picture up there, just a, a little bit of a memory. <laughs> uh, we are here with our children, Drew and Tony Robertson, and we are missionaries with Africa Inland Mission. We have been working in Chad since 2011. There's a little picture of what we looked like when we left, and now our most recent picture. And we haven't really changed much, right? <laughs> uh, so the next picture shows just a couple updates on our boys. Usually that's what people are, are curious about as well. We have two boys, Drew and Tony. Drew is currently at the College of Worcester here in the States. So when we go back to Chad, we'll be leaving him behind here, but with good family and um, a lot of care. And then our other son, Tony, who is in eighth grade. This last term was a little different than previous terms for us. Um, and I'm not gonna be able to talk a lot today, but I just wanted to give you a little taste. And at the end, we will have a table in the fellowship hall and feel free to stop by if you wanna hear more stories or to talk to us more. Uh, the biggest thing for us is that we moved our location in Chad. We moved from down south in a village to the capital in Jemena. And we were there for three years this last term. And our plan is to go back to the same location. Oops, we lost our feed. <laughs> so one of the things that's interesting about our new location is that our neighborhood is an unreached people group, and that means that they do not have a church of their own in their own language with their own culture. It is um, mostly Chadian Arabs, um, but there are also a couple other tribes. This has been a big change for us. One, we had to learn, we're, we're still learning, a new language. But the other big change is that we aren't working with Christian neighbors like we were before. This time we have um, unbelieving neighbors and sometimes people who are quite hostile to Christian ideas. And so we have to be praying very hard to have those relationships be good. Um, I am still working in Christian education. Uh, I work with Christian schools in Chad. There are over 650 Christian schools in Chad. And I get to help by training up the teachers. I work, uh, teach at a teacher training school. I also do mentoring for teachers who end up teaching that didn't get trained to be a teacher, but because they're so desperate for a teacher, they 
hire them anyway. Um, and so that's what I get to do. I also am involved in some training workshops that relate to um, teaching the Bible in Christian schools, especially in non-Christian contexts, and also Christian discipleship, simply helping Christian teachers to grow in their faith. Um, my husband is still working at a hospital doing medical ministry, but it's a different location. Uh, it is in an unreached people group as well. They do have a positive relationship with uh, their neighbors, which has been great. He's going to share a little bit more about something that happened in the hospital while we were there this last term when he comes up to, to talk to you. But there's still incredible needs, obviously, in the capital. Um, people come to the, the hospital because they provide good care. They know it's a Christian hospital, but they know they're going to get good care. Oh, there we've got our pictures again. So there's a picture of me with my um, colleague. We are part of the CE team, which is a Christian education team. Um, and then there's also should be another picture after that of some of my students um, that I teach, and then a classroom where I'm mentoring a teacher and all of her kids. So you can kind of get a sense as to what that classroom looks like. A little different than classrooms here. <laughs> and then there are a couple pictures. Oh, yep, yeah, the trainings. Mm -hmm. Already talked about that. And then Andy at the hospital. So, um, and then maybe the next one is right where I was talking about just the, the critical medical care that continues to be a, a big need there. So he is seeing patients during the week. Um, and if you're interested in some of the stories you see in these pictures, he'll be happy to share those after. We don't have time to go into them. Um, and he's teaching and mentoring uh, Chatty and staff, uh, doctors, nurses, a lot of nurses. He does get to work with other doctors at this hospital. In our previous terms, he ended up being the only doctor at the hospital. So that has been a real blessing for him, that he gets to work with a couple expatriate doctors and some local Chadian doctors. And because of our location, we're part of a church plant. Um, so you can see in the one picture our little church. It's a small one. And uh, on the one picture where there's a guy with a big grin on his face, uh, that is a picture of people looking at the new Chadian Arabic Bible, which just got printed this year. So they're very excited to have a Bible in their language. Um, and we're excited for them as well. We are visiting churches right now, hanging out with our son while he's at college. Um, I'm homeschooling Tony, um, and we're almost to the end of that because we will be heading back to Chad in January, which is our next picture, um, and we'll be working on our language. I will still be working in Christian education. Andy continues to want to do medical ministry. That might look a little different this next time, and our second son will probably be heading off to boarding school as well. And then finally, um, we have the table with resources. I won't read what's on the slide, but just so you know, there's a lot of information there. And if you have questions or you have an interest, please come see us. And a big thank you. Uh, we so appreciate your support, uh, the way that you support us in prayers and emails um, and in finances. We couldn't do what we do if you weren't there, part of the ministry. Um, so thank you. And now Andy's going to come up, and he is going to share the word. Good morning, church. We greet you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We greet you for our church back in Chad and for our pastor, Moise Bao, and the elders there. They want to send their greetings to you as well. Uh, very important that I don't forget that. So you are greeted. Uh, vous êtes salué. Uh, let's pray. Lord, thank you for the time that you've given us this morning. And we pray that you would be with us. Open our ears, open our hearts, speak to us the words that you want us to hear this morning. And may the words of my mouth and the thoughts, meditations of my heart be acceptable to you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so I've been reading in Matthew 10 and I was talking with my son about rotary phones. I was trying to explain to him what a rotary phone was. <clears throat> uh, the son who shall remain nameless. And he said, Dad, you're so old. To him, this is a phone, but it's really not a phone anymore even. It's a computer and 
I know some people who don't even use it to call, they just FaceTime. And it's amazing what phones have become. So it was kind of difficult to explain what a rotary phone was, but my wife and I used a rotary phone when we were first married. I got from my grandmother, and he said, Dad, you're so old. It's, did you know the dinosaurs? <laughs> and I was thinking, sometimes when I read the Bible, it feels like this was so long ago. This was so old. This doesn't, and some people believe, this doesn't really still apply. And yet other times, stories leap off the page and just hit me in the face. And so I wanted to share with you, this is going to be the, maybe one of the most unusual Advent sermons you're going to hear, but I'm going to share an Advent sermon out of Matthew 10. And we're going to talk about persecution. And then we're going to come around to perseverance, promise, and hope. So we've got the light of the first candle here, shining in the darkness, and we've got a, a, a scripture that talks about hope. And I hope by the end of this, my, my wish, my desire by the end of this, is you're going to read this passage with eyes of hope. So this sermon is going to have three parts. Oh, I need my sermon. <laughs> We're going to talk about Matthew. And Matthew is the name of the man who we met in Chad, who has really inspired us. Carrie showed you pictures of the hospital where I work. The founders of the hospital planted the hospital on the outskirts of Jemena, the capital of Chad, intentionally in an area that was unreached, that has no church presence. There are several tribes there. Uh, one of the tribes is the tribe of the president, who's quite powerful, and they are of another faith. They are uh, Muslim, predominantly, and the founder of the hospital said, I'm a Christian. I want you to know that ahead of time, coming in. We want to work with you. We want to treat and care for your people, heal their diseases, but you need to know we're Christians, and they wanted the hospital. They were accepting of the hospital, so they said, that's okay. Um, at the hospital, we have a Bible study every morning. We have prayer time. Every Wednesday, we pray with the patients. We have chaplains on staff. Uh, it's not hidden. It's known by the community. They accept it, um, and we work together with them to heal the patients. So one day, I'm standing outside the men's ward, talking with one of the nurses, and a man walks out, a young man, and he says to me in French, I want to follow Jesus. <laughs> And I thought, wait, what did you just say? I'm, I'm learning French. It's coming along. My chatting Arabic is much weaker. But I, what did you just say? I want to follow Jesus. So I turned to my nurse. Nurse says, Isabel. I said, Isabel, you need to help me out. I think this guy just said, I want to follow Jesus. So there's this flurry of communication, French, Arabic, and after a little bit, she turns to me and she says, yeah, Andy, I think he's sincere. I think he wants to follow Jesus. So I'm excited. I'm, I'm happy for this man. We walk forward on the walkway towards the chaplains. We have two chaplains on staff, both from Ethiopia. We're very blessed to have them as part of the team at the hospital. They begin to disciple this young man. For several weeks, they disciple him. They share more stories from the Bible with him. And he's really growing in his faith. That's part one of the story. As I was reading Matthew 10, I felt like this story was coming up off the pages. We have to go back a little bit further than the passage we read today, but starting in Matthew 5, uh, verse 5, chapter 10, verse 5, Jesus sends out the 12. He gives the following instructions. Go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. Take no gold or silver or copper in your belts, no bag for your journey or two tunics or sandals or a staff for laborers deserve their food. So Jesus sends them out with these instructions. I feel like in Chad, we're trying to do this. We've been sent out. Thank you for sending us. We appreciate the support. We wouldn't be there without your support. Carrie and I have been sent. We go, we proclaim, we cure the sick, 
we resuscitate, we cleanse lepers, and if, le if lepers mean skin diseases, we take care of many skin diseases. We have leishmaniasis there, which is um, really, really, and leprosy, it's really unusual. We cast out demons. The pastors deal with spiritual warfare all the time. I feel like so far this is a really exciting missionary story. We've been sent out, we proclaim, and someone has responded. Matthew has responded. It seems like a fairly typical story to this point. Part two of this sermon, what are the consequences? This is where the story takes a turn and may not seem like an Advent sermon. In, this, in the scriptures we read today, Jesus says, I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. What happens to a sheep in the midst of, a, of wolves? They will hand you over. They will flog you. You will be dragged before governors and kings as a testimony. Do not worry about what you will say, for it will be given to you at that time. Brother will betray brother to death. A father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by all because of my name. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. That's not a typical Advent sermon. I've been really meditating on this passage. What does Jesus say? I'm sending you out like sheep among wolves. What does he not say? He doesn't say that when you go out as a sheep, the wolves will change and become like sheep. He never promises that the wolves will change. And he also doesn't tell us that when you get out there as sheep among the wolves and the wolves are being rough, you should change and be, become like them. Sheep, you need to become like wolves to make it in this world. I am most tempted to do that. Confronted with someone who's really aggressive, I tend to feel myself wanting to become more aggressive, to resist, to fight back. He does not say, sheep, become like wolves. He does not promise that the wolves will get all peaceful and become like sheep. So when sheep go among the wolves, the inevitable re result will be what Jesus promised, persecution. So this is part two of our story. One day, the Ethiopian pastors come to us and say, Andy, Carrie, our team, our friend Matthew has disappeared. We can't get a hold of him. We've tried calling him. He's not answering his phone. For many weeks, we had no idea where he was. Then we found out he was in prison. Eventually, the pastors were allowed to visit him. The story that they heard was amazing. Matthew had gone home, and he had followed Jesus, so he had a Bible. He was reading his Bible. His family found out he was reading a Bible. They wanted nothing to do with Jesus and nothing to do with the Bible. They took his Bible away. They took his phone away. They locked him in a room for three days. They gave him no food or water. His grandmother was slipping him food and water underneath the door. After three days, they put him in prison. Now, he was unjustly imprisoned. You might say, you should go to the police, and you know, we need to work this out. It's not fair. His family is part of the police force. They were part of the reason he was in jail. That was not an option. But our friend Matthew was not um, angry. He was still full of joy. He told our pastors, I had a dream, I had a vision. I knew this was gonna to happen to me. I had a vision of a man in white. And the man in white came to me with the two of you next to him. And the man in white said to me, don't worry, don't be afraid. Pastor one and pastor two will be with you. They will take care of you, you can trust these men. And then in the vision, the men disappeared and all that was left was the man in white. And he said, but even if they aren't with you, I will always be with you. And that's what happened. They threw him in jail. Our pastor friends couldn't be with him. And yet he still had Jesus with him in prison. And he could talk with other prisoners about Jesus. Because what, what could they do to him? He's already in prison. And he still had joy. He still had hope.
Jesus wrote these words, or sorry, Matthew wrote these words about Jesus 2,000 years ago. Do these words still apply today? They do. They're happening as we speak to Matthew. The passage continues. In verse 26, Jesus says, So have no fear of them. So now we are talking about part three, what should be our response to persecution? And Jesus says several times here, have no fear. Verse 26, have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light. What you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Verse 31, so do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. What are our instructions here? Well, first of all, have no fear. Secondly, he says, he says Jesus says, acknowledge me. And the last thing he says is persevere. Have an eternal perspective, persevere to the end. Have no fear, acknowledge Jesus, and persevere to the end. So our story about Matthew continues. After several months in prison, he was released. We were happy. He continued to meet with the pastors, and then he disappeared again. He was gone for several weeks again. This time we feared for his life. It's entirely possible, and it does happen in Chad, that believers who turn to Jesus sometimes are killed for their faith. But he wasn't killed. After several months, he reappeared. He reappeared in July, right before we were to come home. Every Wednesday on our compound, we have a Bible study, and he showed up at this Wednesday Bible study. And we were full of joy, and he told his story. He had been taken from his home again and taken far, far away from the capital, out to a village. He was put in a Islamic school. He was chained, so he couldn't leave. And he was forced to learn that education, indoctrinated. They really, really wanted him to stop being a Christian. After several weeks, he escaped. He walked back to the capital, and there he was amongst, amongst us at our Bible study. We often do a time of sharing. People can share which song they would like to sing. He asked if we could sing Jusqu'au bout. It's a song in French that means just until the end. Jusqu'au bout, je veux te suivre. Just until the end, I want to follow you, Jesus. So here's a man who'd been unjustly imprisoned, who'd been beaten, who'd been chained up, who'd been hated by his family, and he wanted to sing just until the end. I want to follow Jesus. He's an amazing encouragement to me. When I read Matthew 10, Matthew's story leaps out of the pages at me and gives me hope. Jesus, at the end of this chapter, quotes Micah. And he's talking about the persecution. And in verse 30. Five, he says, for I've come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. He's quoting Micah, who spoke a thousand years before that. In Micah 7, he says that exact thing. Put no trust in a friend, have no confidence in a loved one, guard the doors of your mouth, and from her who lies in your embrace, for the son treats the father with contempt, the daughter rises up against her mother, the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, your enemies are members of your own household. In this world, there will be persecution. When we go out as sheep, we will be with the wolves. Jesus never says it will be great, it will be easy, it will be comfortable. But he says, have perseverance just until the end. I've prepared a place for you. They cannot take away your soul. 
We may not feel that type of persecution here in the United States, but it's happening. It's happening in other parts of the world. It's happening in Chad. It happened to our friend Matthew. Things are rough though. I know it's been a rough season. Um, COVID has been a rough season. There are things that happen in this life here in the US too. Maybe you're struggling, maybe you're hurting, maybe you're wondering as we get into this Advent season, um, is there really hope? So Micah says it, and that's the passage we chose for the scripture, the Old Testament scripture this morning. After Micah says, this is the persecution, this, these are gonna be the difficulties, put no trust in anyone, even your own family. In verse seven he says, but as for me, I will look to the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation, my God will hear me. As for me, I will look to the Lord, I will wait for the God of my salvation, my God will hear me. That's the message of hope Matthew clung to when his family was turning on him. And that's the message of hope Jesus gives us as he's instructing his disciples. So that's the message of hope I want us to take home with us today. Whatever your situation, wait for the God of your salvation. Your God will hear you. Even if you're hated, by all because of Jesus' name, the one who endures to the end will be saved. So church, don't fear. Acknowledge Jesus and have an eternal perspective. The promise is eternal life. Persecution is normal. The one who endures and perseveres to the end will be saved. Hallelujah, amen.
Now hear the words of our benediction. But as for me, I watch and hope for the Lord. I wait for God, my Savior. My God will hear me. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. And may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. Amen. Amen.